Hi there. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's a, it's a beautiful venue. It's nice and intimate, so I think we're going to have a great evening. So welcome, in fact, to the inaugural 2017 Origins event. And I'm, it's going to be an amazing evening. What an evening it's going to be, you'll see. Uh, this, there's a number of reasons this evening is special besides the fact that Frank Wilczek is here um, and besides the fact that it's our first event of the year. Uh, this happens to be the kickoff event, the first kickoff event after the university announced its ASU 2020, Campaign 2020, a $1.5 billion campaign to raise money for the university and for projects like the Origins Project. So uh, we are hoping that, that the community will, will help ASU and we have big plans for Origins and we hope that you'll consider things that you support, do to support the campaign will, will support our project. So I encourage you to consider that and since this is the opening event, I kind of feel we have a special obligation to mention on behalf of the university that um, your, your pockets will be empty by the time you leave this <laughs> room. Um, there's another thing I want to mention. The second event of the year, you'll be the first to know about it. We haven't yet advertised it on our webpage, but we'll be associated with a workshop that actually Frank will be here to attend, a scientific workshop. We're having a public event on Saturday night, February 25th, called um, The Future of Artificial Intelligence, Who's in Control? And it's going to be a remarkable lineup of people. But uh, like President Trump, I'm going to keep that a secret until uh, <laughs> uh, the last moment. I, those words hurt me to say. But, uh, but, um, uh, but you'll be alerted. It will be an amazing event. And uh, tickets will go on sale later this week. And you should get them soon, because I think it's going to sell out, given, given the group of people that are there. But so much for the, for the future. Right now, we are indeed privileged to have my friend and colleague for over 30 years in general in physics, and now my colleague here at ASU, Frank Wilczek, who is without a doubt one of the most creative minds in physics in, in my generation, and also one of the most accomplished physicists as well. Following his uh, thesis work when, at Princeton when he switched from, uh, from mathematics to physics uh, when he was 21, uh, the work for which he did his thesis on is work which then approximately 30 years later uh, he won the Nobel Prize for his thesis work uh, in 2004 for eff effectively unveiling one of the four forces in nature. But following that he has done seminal contributions not only in his home area of particle physics but also in cosmology and also the physics of materials. And that's what makes tonight so, so exciting. It's going to be a wonderful night of discovery and ideas, because in some sense it will span the areas that he has thought about and thinks about in such a unique way. So it's going to be a wonderful night. And then after he presents a lecture on that, he and I are going to chat on stage, as physicists do. And, um, and then there'll be an intermission, and you'll, we'll, we'll take your cards, and we'll, uh, we'll have an open question for all of you. And, uh, and so uh, right now, I am thrilled to invite uh, my wonderful friend and colleague, Frank Wilczek. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, I'm glad to see again uh, what I've experienced so many times at the, the uh, Tempe area and uh, Phoenix and ASU is a vibrant place where uh, events like this get a big, enthusiastic audience. So thank you for coming. Despite the rather intimidating title, <laughs> materi Materiality of a Vacuum, uh, I actually have a different title that I thought about using, and here it comes. What is a universe? I thought that might draw the wrong kind of crowd, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to keep up a higher standard. Uh, let me ta start by telling you a story. Imagine that there were a planet far away that was immersed in a deep ocean, and uh, over time, the fish in that ocean uh, started to become very intelligent. What would their conception of the physical world and of physics be like? Well, at first, 
they would regard their surroundings, the water, as just the way things are. They wouldn't have a concept that there was a world without water. That's the way it always is. Uh, they'd think of that as space. That's what space is. But eventually, as they got more sophisticated, they would realize that they could get simpler laws of physics by imagining a world in which there was no water. You take that away, because that complicates the motion, complicates the properties of things that exist in the water. And uh, they'd start to think of water, space for them, as a material. They would think that uh, this is a material like others. You know, and like other materials, it could, have, it could exist in different phases. It could be steam or ice. Uh, and this would empower them. This would empower them to manipulate their water, but also to manipulate materials in general as they learned about the concepts uh, that govern the behavior of matter. They might even start to think about the world outside <laughs> and cosmology. <laughs> the big idea that I want to convey and document and extend in this lecture is simply this. We're like those fish. So let me start by uh, the documentation Talking, telling you about the concepts that enable us to make a profound analogy, an identity, really, between what we ordinarily perceive as space and materials. Like many things in physics, this goes back to uh, this fella. This, this was Albert Einstein in 1905, before he became the uh, wild-haired gray, gray sage, but this was in his glory days when he... Uh, and I, that's when he discovered special relativity and Brownian motion and photons in one year. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and what our, our uh, special interest in this discussion will be the photon. So in 1905, Einstein put forward the revolutionary idea based on a variety of experiments that I won't uh, describe, but it was ahead of its time and it was, in fact, hotly disputed for many years afterwards, the idea that light can act actually comes in particles, in distinct packets of, of energy that have particle properties. Less celebrated, perhaps, less known to the general public, but I think equally profound and very germane to our topic, is that two years later, Einstein discovered that he could change one of the letters in photon <laughs> and get another particle. <laughs> These are phonons. These superficially are quite different. Phonons have to do with vibrations in crystals, whereas light was understood already at the beginning of the 20th century, and in fact since the mid-19th century, to be uh, a phenomenon of electric and magnetic fields uh, it, propagating through space. Disturbance is an electromagnetic field, electric and magnetic fields propagating through space. That superficially could not seem more different than vibrations in a solid like silicon. Okay, so one's empty space, one's a solid, one's these kind of abstract things, electric and magnetic fields, the other is very concrete, it's the atoms in the solid moving. And yet, Einstein guessed that they would have crucial properties in common. The crucial property especially is that both of them come in discrete units, come in particles, effectively. That's hence photons, particles of light, and phonons, particles of vibration. So, switching metaphors slightly from, creature, from fish in water to the citizens of siliconia, that live inside silicon, they would also consider their surroundings, the lump of silicon, as the default condition. That's space. That's, that's what it is. Uh, and they would regard the phonons, these particles, as elementary particles. They would, they would be, for all intents and purposes, the kind of particles that they dealt with uh, in their existence similarly to how we deal with photons.
But we know better. Right? We know that their particles, those siliconian particles, are actually small disturbances in what they think, fools that they are, <laughs> is empty space. <laughs> but it's actually not. It's a material. The message of this lecture, again, is that according to modern physics, our elementary particles are also small disturbances, small excitations in uh, empty space. So to elaborate on that and make it very concrete, to bring it home so you can internalize it, let me tell you what you're made out of. This is a picture of empty space. These are snapshots of empty space according to our deepest understanding of physics in what's called quantum chromodynamics, the theory of the strong force that Lawrence mentioned. Uh, what we perceive as empty space and what our eyes would see if they could see much smaller distances and resolve much faster times uh, is actually a medium that's full of spontaneous activity. These are sometimes called virtual particles, sometimes called zero-point motion, uh, sometimes called vacuum fluctuations, quantum fluctuations. Whatever you call them, they are fluctuations in the energy density of space on very short distance and time scales. And according to our theories, which have many other consequences we can check accurately and directly, uh, this is what happens. The same kind of calculations that give this picture showing the distribution of energy in, in space when you take snapshots uh, also allow us to calculate the mass of the proton and their properties uh, very uh, successfully. Uh, so in this picture, the, the brighter colors indicate a higher density of energy and the, the lesser colors are lesser energy. And you, look, you can see that there's weather in space all the time. It's, it's spontaneous, self-driven weather. Here's an animation of it, a movie, where you cut away some of the, uh, the regions with not so much energy so you can actually look inside and uh, you don't do such complicated, you do cruder calculations so you can take, uh, make a movie out of it, take uh, and but this, this gives you an idea that inside all of us, all the time, there are these, and everywhere in empty space too, there are these fluctuations that make the world kind of a gigantic lava lamp. <laughs> now what about that space, that's empty space, all this activity going on all the time, all these fluctuations. What are we? Well, here's what, what we are. <laughs> if you take uh, little excitations in those, in those gluon fields that we show, and also little uh, excitations in quark fields, they can form a self-contained disturbance, like, like a hurricane in the storm, but a very wee disturbance <laughs> that uh, uh, is pictured here. So you have to imagine in this picture You've, this is uh, a disturbance in that medium that's fluctuating wildly all the time. You have to average out over all that stuff and you get a tiny residual, which is this wispy thing, and that's the particle that we're made out of. That's, those are the kinds of things we're made out of. Little disturbances analogous to uh, disturbances of the, the crystal that make phonons here, the, there's no crystal, but it's empty space that can vibrate, and if you just make uh, disturbances in, in, in the pattern of vibrations, uh, those are seen as particles. Uh, this, uh, the phonon, photons are one example. Uh, this is another example. So, in that very strong sense, we are ethereal beings. We're children of the ether just as fish are children of the water, <laughs> if you like. And citizens of Siliconia would be children of silicon. Really? <laughs> Didn't you read that ether is totally discredited? That it, that it was something that went out with the theory of relativity in 1905? 
Well, let's revisit the history. <laughs> what, first of all, what was the ether? Or what is the ether? The original ether was something that was postulated by James Clerk Maxwell, the great hero of uh, 19th century physics, usually regarded together with Newton and Einstein as the triad, the holy trinity of theoretical physics, and my favorite, actually. Uh, he was trying to put together the laws of electricity and magnetism, as they were known at that time, into a consistent system. And he thought it would be useful to make a consistent set of equations to make a mechanical model that would be consistent, because it's a model and you know how mechanics work, so if you could find a model that has things that behave like electric fields and magnetic fields and make it fully consistent, it might have other surprising properties that, uh, that would improve the equations. That was his strategy. And he succeeded. He made a model, very complicated, with magnetic fields described as vortices that spun around, and uh, the electric fields were little uh, greased balls that circulated around the vortices. This is a, a picture of it. Uh, and he got equations that way from this model that to this day we call Maxwell's equations that are the successful equations of electricity and magnetism. He had to change things that weren't consistent with this picture. But then having made the model, he threw it away because he said, okay, I've shown these equations are consistent. However I got there, uh, you don't have to believe that, but there's some kind of substance, maybe not this particular arrangement of balls and vortices, but some kind of substance that supports the electric and magnetic fields, and he called it the ether. And Maxwell loved this idea. This is, to me, a really touching uh, testimony. He was a very religious man, too, uh, as you can see from this quote. He said, the vast interplanetary and interstellar regions will no longer be regarded as waste places in the universe, which the Creator has not seen fit to fill with the symbols of the manifold order of his kingdom. We shall find them to be already full of this wonderful medium, so full that no human power can remove them from the smallest portion of space or produce the slightest flaw in its infinite continuity. So Maxwell loved his ether, and it's inspiring to think that space is not empty, that it's full, you know, nothing is wasted, and that, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> this same guy, 1905, in his relativity uh, work, famously uttered the sentence that the introduction of a luminifer luminiferous ether will prove to be superfluous. So uh, he worked from exactly the same equations as Maxwell. It's very... Uh, uh, Ironic. He used exact, in fact, it was Maxwell's study of Maxwell's equations that led him to special relativity. But he, whereas Maxwell loved the idea that there's a medium that supports it, Einstein really didn't like it at first because the medium would have to have very strange properties, namely the properties that he wanted in special relativity. And he thought that was absurd. No material could have that property, so the heck with it. Well, he grew up, and by 1920, just before he got his Nobel Prize for the photon in 1921, this, this picture is his Nobel Prize picture, actually, uh, he, he said, he wrote, that more careful reflection teaches us, however, that the special theory of relativity does not compel us to deny ether. What it means is that if you have an ether, it has to obey the equations of special relativity, not Newtonian mechanics. But that's fine. Special relativity is good. There's not really a contradiction. So it took Einstein 15 years to wise up, but that's, that's, <laughs> the, that's what it is. Indeed, Einstein's general relativity made space-time itself a dynamic material, an ether if ever there was one. 
space is, has many properties that you would think of as associated with the material in general relativity. It can weigh. This is the so-called cosmological term that, in fact, was measured. The, the density of vacuum was just measured to be non-zero a few years ago. Uh, it can warp. It can bend. This, according to general relativity, in fact, is how gravity works. Matter bends the space around it, and the space-time around it, I should say, and other particles do their best to move straight in that space-time. But the space-time is warped, so they wind up taking curvy paths, and that's how the force of gravity arises. You have to work out the equations, but that's, that's the leading idea. And recently, in the last couple of years, we've learned experimentally that space-time can even ring. These are called gravitational waves. If you have a disturbance, like throwing a stone into an ocean, but now you're throwing an excitation into space-time, the space-time reacts by sending out waves, these gravitational waves that uh, can be detected very, very far away if you have sensitive enough instruments. And this was discovered a little over a year ago, finally uh, observed in an extraordinary feat of engineering and science. <clears throat> uh, this picture is futuristic, but shows something that I hope mankind will build. It will be the largest and most glorious structure ever built by mankind. This would be to detect gravitational waves of very long wavelength and would span the solar system. You'd put uh, lasers and mirrors in place so that they could detect distortions of space-time. <clears throat> so that's one ether. Space itself becomes dynamical, has material properties. It bends, it warps, it weighs, and it can ring. But there's more. In quantum chromodynamics, our theory of the strong force, our theory of quarks and gluons, there's another space-filling uh, material. Uh, we call it sometimes a condensate because physicists like obscure words. Uh, this is a condensate of quark-antiquark -quark pairs. So here's a picture of it, a little bit idealized. Quarks and antiquarks. So you have to imagine that everywhere in space there's this condensate, like a cloud, of quark and antiquark -quark pairs. Okay, in this picture, uh, the little bars over the letters indicate that they're anti-quarks. So they're U, D, and S quarks, and anti-U, anti-D, and anti-S. So according to QCD, this material, this stuff, is filling space. How do we know? Well, it turns out that it's very much like the silicon and phonon story. You can have vibrations in this material, calculate its properties, and they correspond to the elementary particles that are known as pions, which otherwise would be very hard to understand. And so, so this, this, this is eerily like the old idea of a luminiferous ether whose vibrations gave light. For photons, it has to be what we call empty space, but that's, I hope I'm convincing you, a kind of material. For pions, it's literally a material that we could imagine taking away or putting in or boiling away at high temperatures. It's vibrations of that material that make the phonons, which are pions. And there's more. Here's a handy dandy chart of different condensates. I put, and materials, I put the quark anti quark condensate in the middle. Uh, you may have heard of high temperature superconductors. They, they lose their superconductivity at a rather high temperature of 10 to the of 100 Kelvin, 10 to the 2 Kelvin. Uh, the quark anti quark condensate will also boil away, will change, lose its character. Uh, but you have to take it to a rather higher temperature, 10 to the 12th Kelvin. So it's a super-duper-whooper uh, super high-temperature superconductor. 
I remind you that silicon, which supported the phonons, melts at about 1,000 degrees. And in more, uh, in, uh, we found it useful in understanding the properties of fundamental physics to introduce other condensates. A famous one is the Higgs condensate. You may have heard out of, of that's listed just under the QQ bar condensate. It uh, has a characteristic temperature of 10 to the 15th Kelvin. And we believe, based on our theories, that in the Big Bang, where temperatures like that were achieved, that also would have melted. So the quark and antiquark condensate melts, and the similar Higgs condensate melts, changing the properties of all the particles. The pions behave in very different, cease to exist, basically, once the quark-antiquark condensate goes away. And uh, the Higgs particle would also have very different properties. And many particles that now have mass would lose their mass uh, at those very high temperatures. This picture now that we think of empty space as containing as well as being a material, and uh, that the uh, things it contains or th th uh, can melt, can change properties at high temperatures, can exist in different phases, just as water exists as ice or steam or liquid water, enables us to think new ideas in cosmology. In fact, it forces us to confront the idea that at very high temperatures in the Big Bang, the structure would be different. Space would be fundamentally different. So in some of the phases of space that you can imagine, uh, sp space exerts negative pressure. It's like an unstable phase that exerts some, some phases of matter exert positive pressure, others exert negative pressure. Things that have negative pressure want to grow. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't take a force to hold them in, it takes a force to keep them from growing, and so they, if there's no compensating force, they, they just grow. And this is something that can make space itself grow in a process that's called inflation. Inflating phases can grow very large, very quickly, and in fact, it's not ridiculous to think that the origin of the Big Bang itself is one of these inflating phases. In fact, cosmology offers some evidence for that. And uh, that it could happen again, that it may have happened before in other places. So here's a picture of what might have happened in cosmic history. All of our universe is one part of one of these bubbles. Okay, because it sprouted at some point in the Big Bang, hasn't yet recondensed, may never, uh, but all these for some reason have re-collapsed. Uh, and the, pic the different colors in the picture are meant to suggest that these different universes might have different kinds of material as what they call empty space, and so would have very different apparent laws of physics, because the behavior of stuff in them would be conditioned by which empty space they were in, and those are different. Here's a more evocative picture, so that's, that's kind of a technical picture, a technical cartoon of, of this possibility of a sprouting universes. Uh, here's what uh, it looks like to an artist. You imagine this uh, Young, young woman looking out and seeing in the sky not a homogeneous distribution of stars and galaxies that looks pretty much the same in all directions, which is what we've seen so far, but if you look far enough or wait far enough for the light to arrive, you might see uh, quite different laws of physics and behaviors uh, existing very far away. Now, these are Still somewhat speculative ideas. Uh, I would say 50 years ago, they would have been regarded as absolutely crazy. Now they're regarded as the frontier of physics. <laughs> Maybe still crazy, but, but a lot more respectable. Well, 
staring in wonder at these possibilities or thinking abstractly about them and speculating is awesome, it's fun, but it's a little passive. Right? Can we do something more active? Can we be creators of new universes? Yes, we can. <laughs> Once we know that the key to a universe is its material substrate, you know, be it silicon or be it water, uh, we can think about different universes based on different material substrates. We can even consider uh, universes which have lower dimension than two. That's particularly easy because it doesn't take much material to make such a universe. Right? But you can have creatures, you can imagine creatures that live out their lives in two-dimensional materials. They would think that's the universe and they would think that that material is space. So, for instance, graphene is a remarkable substance that, again, was only discovered a few years ago. Uh, it's single-layer carbon, so it's a two-dimensional world, has all kinds of potential uses and remarkable properties. And one property is that you can build uh, apartment buildings in flatland. <laughs> so two-dimensional creatures could have uh, places to live that would be very attractive. And uh, you can also use this for, in, for useful things like filtering chemicals, but that's by the by. Uh, uh, I'd like to mention one particularly remarkable thing that I've been involved in and is now becoming extremely popular and even attracting big bucks of investment. Uh, in some materials, in two dimensions, it has to be, it has, turns out for consistency region, it has to be two dimensional worlds. Uh, the, there are emergent particles, so the same sort of thing as phonons or pions or photons. Uh, so, but they, in all cases, it's the properties of the particles are conditional on what the properties of the material they're arising from is. And in some of these materials that we can design and think about, uh, the particles have a remarkable property, they have memories. These are really smart particles. These are, and they're, they're called anions, if they have memories. This was something that was only uh, shown to, or imagined to be theoretically possible in the mid-1980s, and it's only now that experimentalists are finally uh, catching up with it. Uh, here's, here's what a really powerful particle looks like, an anion. Large numbers of anions, so a single anion has kind of a primitive memory, but large numbers of anions can have a powerful collective memory. Each one affects the others, and you can have a gigantic sort of multiplication of memories. So it's, it's as if uh, each anion uh, enabled you to, each anion that you add enables you to double the size of the memory. So that gets very large very fast. <laughs> People are working to build a kind of new computer that exploits that possibility. These are called topological quantum computers. And to show how serious this is, Microsoft is investing in it <laughs> in, in a substantial way. So uh, in the future, the favorite and most powerful location of intelligence might be in Flatland. It's a case where less is more, <laughs> where having these possibilities gives you better ways of thinking, if you like. Uh, and maybe we can look forward someday to the grateful, super-intelligent creatures of Flatland uh, thanking us for creating them. So. <laughs> There we are. So I hope I've intrigued you with the idea, the big idea, that space is just another material. That empowers us in two ways. It allows us to imagine other kinds of space far away as uh, locations for cosmology, but it also allows us to think creatively about making our own universes with new and interesting properties. 
So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. But, um, people are dizzy, so they're sitting. But uh, <laughs> okay, we'll sit for a second. So I thought we'd have a little discussion about some of yes. these ideas, and then, as I say, while we're talking, you can, ideas can percolate for those of you, and there are cards in each of your programs. So um, at the intermission, you'll be bringing them down, to, and people will collect them, and and the really good ones. Well, um, questions we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards, and some of the not so good ones, so don't worry. <laughs> um, so, these ideas which are central to modern physics are kind of fascinating, and it's hard, as you know, at this time for me not to be a little self-serving. Uh, um, why why the, should this time be why different this time from any other time? time. <laughs> but um, but I, I've gotten a lot of flack over the years be, because when I wrote a book called The Universe of Nothing, because yes. I talked about that, that in modern physics, the definition of nothing has kind of changed. And, um, and, and nothing, what people once called nothing is not nothing for us anymore. And so I wanted to have a little discussion about nothing. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, because it's an interesting, because yes. in some sense well, it's manifest that something that people thought of as nothing is not really nothing. Yes, well, what our senses naturally dispose us to think of as nothing, namely the absence of anything we can perceive without a lot of help is clearly obsolete because now we have a lot of help. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can look very closely at the structure of space. We, can, we have elaborate theoretical structures that we test, test, test indirectly that tell us that space is full, as I described. Uh, and we know that the same concepts we use to describe space uh, without material are exactly the same concepts that prove to be extremely fruitful in describing what anyone would call a material. So, uh, so the idea that the physical picture, the proper physical picture of the world is particles moving through emptiness, through a void, which became, which by no means was uh, Pop was uh, self-evident. Mm -hmm. It was far from so. I'll come back to that. But but which which became uh, popular uh, in the in the wake of of Newtonian physics, that doesn't seem that seems totally obsolete. I would say, uh, philosophers like Aristotle talked about nature abhors a vacuum, uh, and. Uh, Descartes wanted to fill the world with a, with a fluid. People, people didn't naturally think of space as empty until the tremendous success of Newtonian mechanics, which was based, and his picture of the solar system and planets, which was based on the idea that, that, that you had particles moving through space that didn't have any independent properties. You know? So. Uh, I like to make a dis and but now we know better. I mean, as things, I mean, Newton's picture is is wonderful for its time and had many successes. But now, as we've looked deeper, it's become more and more clear that we can't maintain that picture. That this, we have to use space as a dynamical medium. It bends, it shakes, <laughs> it uh, it weighs, uh, and there are all these ethers that support. Uh, uh, spontaneous activity and, and pions and so forth. Uh, so, the I, so I like to make a distinction between vacuum and void, which is, I think, what you're going, or what you're heading towards. So, void is the uh, idea that was inspired by Newtonian physics. That space is just like a stage with no actors on it, and the actors go on the stage and do their thing, but the stage is just a platform, doesn't have any independent properties. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, the, the, that would be a void. A vacuum is something else. A vacuum, to us, in physics, people commonly talk about a vacuum as what you get if you remove everything you can easily, or even with a lot of effort. Uh, but that, we've learned, doesn't deserve to be called empty, because it contains a lot of structure, a lot of activity, and we can't understand the behavior of the things we do see 
if we don't ascribe space itself those properties. So space is not a void. So I mean, let me. I want to push a little further because I, yeah. I, I, uh, I have said that that, and people don't like that. Physicists <laughs> have changed the definition of what people thought was nothing, and that, at least, it seems to me that the well, that one would say that, and, and I think it reinforced by what you said is that the that what people thought was nothing, namely empty spaces, that nothing is really not different than something at all. There's no real difference in that kind of nothing if you mean what people thought of as empty space and stuff and, well, and the siliconia. It's just, it's just, it's just almost semantics. Do you, would that's, you, would, I think that's the deep message of what I was yeah. saying. Yes, that, uh, well, I put it another way. Again, yeah. it's uh, uh, vacuum is not void. void. Now, <laughs> void. Uh, now, the, I want to ask you. The opinion, absence of particles, the absence of excitations is not the absence of structure. Yeah. Any more than if you, you know, if you take a lump of silicon and cool it to ac absolute zero, so it has no excitations at all, it's still a lump of silicon. Yeah. It's still a material. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but let me. I want to take it a step further to push you, to because uh, I'm not sure we agree, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> You're trying. Uh, but, not well, to make but, us but hopefully we do, because <laughs> I'm right. But uh, um, no. Uh, so, it, but but you, as you eloquently point out, that space itself is a material. Yes. And so. By um, any reasonable definition. By any reasonable definition. Yes. And in fact, since in a quantum theory, space itself fluctuates, mm -hmm. then the absence of space is just another kind of nothing, but it's really not that different than the other kinds of nothing. So we, even having no space, in some sense, is not that different than having space. It's just, well, it it's seems just, pretty different to me. If, I, it, <laughs> I mean, in the sense that, that, there's, that you're popping universes out I'm of space. I'm reminded of, of what... Uh, of what St. Augustine said about uh, someone who questioned the existence of hell. They said, well, uh, where is hell? And he said, well, that's where people who ask questions like that go. <laughs> 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 <You> know, <laughs> well, I've never been afraid space, of hell, so I'm going to continue to, you know, to go, since it doesn't or the exist. Other, the other <laughs> definition of space is what there yeah. is so that things aren't all on top of each other, and time is what prevents everything from happening but, at once. But, we, but, but, but I mean, but, if we extend our minds... So but that, that's kind of a minimal definition of yeah. space and time. That's kind of the void that has yeah. no other properties except to be a repository for where actual stuff might be and where nothing is, where no particles are, that there's strictly nothing, right? That, yeah. That it, uh, and all and has no dynamics, has no properties, and uh, that seemed very plausible. And that was the picture that Newtonian mechanics was based on. So, but no longer does. No, lo but no, no longer, longer even remotely that, seems plausible. But I guess if we can think of a meta. I mean, it, we're used to thinking in terms of space, but we now think of space as something from which particles can pop in and out of existence yes. and do all the time. But in some sense, if if gravity is a quantum theory. Yes. Then we have to think of sort of the absence of space as being pot as being a potential for whole universes to pop in and out of existence at any time, and it's it's sort of one extra extension of, wh of where you're heading, it, because it, because in the picture of quantum gravity, that's what's happening. Spaces that didn't exist are popping into existence, just like particles that didn't e exist are popping into existence. So I wanted well, to get your take because I know I know we think I, about it differently. I. I'm not, I'm uneasy with that idea. <laughs> because I think, uh, you know, there are all kinds of fluctuations, that's true. Uh, but the fluctuations are never such as to, to take everything away. I mean, they're, they're kind of fluctuations in the topology of space time, they're fluctuations in the geometry of space time. In fact, the existence of fluctuations that change topology is not really even clearly established. But but so it, there are fluctuations, but you can certainly speculate about uh, creating the a cold universe where there was none. If you, that well, pinches off, right? You can you can certainly speculate about it, but that's not. I don't think that's firmly established, uh, and even if it happened, I wouldn't call it something from nothing. It's something well, from uh, a boiling it, mass it, 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 well, of fluctuations. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be happened. nothing, but it would redefine what. What I, what I think it would mean is that yes. even the absence of space would not necessarily be properly called nothing because, because, they're part, because their universe is popping in 
whole space time is popping into existence. I mean, what I mean is it, that what we that we keep changing what we think of as nothing. That I agree with. Yes, we certainly <laughs> we agree. With well, that. Let, let's <laughs> let's. I wanted to push as far as I could in that one, but right. but let's let's let me push let me push in another direction. Dimensions. You, yes. We talked about we talked about anions and two dimensional physics. Yes. In in physics, as you know, in the kind of physics we do, people are talking about extra More dimensions. Dim yes. Would you consider? Um, in what sense would you consider dimensions as kind of a material, uh, being sort of that we? Oh, we, they're very much a material. In the sense that we feel like we're fish because we live in three dimensions, but yes. maybe, maybe. Uh, well, it's so like I mean, the, the most vivid way to think about it, I think, is is uh, what uh, Abbott did in his book Flatland. You can mm. think about. It's easy for us to think about creatures yeah. in lower dimension, then we put ourselves in their shoes, uh, and they, you know, try to. Imagine how would how would they imagine a higher dimension, uh, and it's a it's a fun exercise. You can, you can you, and we can and we can do the same thing. We can easily imagine. It's easy to now with modern mathematics. It's very easy. In fact, it's hard to stop yourself from writing extra dimensions. Yeah. It's just you write down four coordinates instead of three. Why not? You know why not? Well, <laughs> in fact, in many other contexts, we routinely use spaces of high dimension to describe colors, to describe uh, 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 statistical distributions about you know, properties of people or populations that depend on many variables. That's a many dimensional space. Uh, so I'm not sure what the question well, is. Well, I question think the question is, question is <laughs> so we were but, talking, you have these little, these little guys that Einstein's shaking the hands of, these yes. two dimensional guys. So, in f uh, uh, I can see it over there, I can't see it up here, but it doesn't matter. Um, so, in what sense do you think it's, it might be productive to think of ourselves as little three-dimensional guys shaking the hand of a four-dimensional, uh, 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 so well, the properties of our universe may be, yes. um, uh, well, a, 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 as many people think, it, a remnant of a higher yes, dimensional well, it, can, space. It, it certainly is a uh, coherent theoretical possibility that uh, one should explore, and one can imagine it's mind-stretching if nothing else, yeah. And as, as you know, many of our colleagues have been obsessed with the notion that space is really uh, nine-dimensional, space-time ten-dimensional, and it's folded up to look, many of the dimensions are folded up to look effectively like our three plus one-dimensional space-time. Uh, and it's had some modest success, but mostly not been very fruitful, I would say, <laughs> or it's been disappointing, yeah. let's put it that way. Uh, but. It, you know, it's certainly worth exploring, and people st still do explore it, and something good might come out of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I share that with you, but the, but the I, let me put you on 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 uh, on the stage here to ask you. Um, so, and we, you know, this is almost the 10th anniversary of uh, Origins, and we'll talk yes. about that in a little bit. We're going to celebrate that soon, and we're going to look at what things have changed since the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, the next 10 years of Origins, 10 years when yes. 10 years from now. What do you think the odds are that there are extra dimensions? Well, I want to there are two different questions. What are yeah. the odds are that there are extra dimensions, yeah. and what are the odds that there will be evidence for extra dimensions well, that, yeah. that would satisfy a critical the person in the next 10 years? I think the latter is very far-fetched. Yeah, I agree. What about I, the former? The former, I think, is not improbable. That <laughs> <laughs> But it's kind of a, get you to commit here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard, you know, it's hard, it's hard, if you don't propose a definite hypothesis, mm. I can't be very precise about what... And that's the know, problem, there so really is no definite, definite hypothesis. No, I think that's, that's right. the point. We've learned as we've that, studied this, so, that what yeah. was once clear is right. becoming less clear all the time. Well, let me, yeah, I, I want to make a, I, a general philosophical okay. point, which I love, uh, the, which is uh, science deals in truth sometimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> but more of the time it deals with uh, fruitfulness, effectiveness. You know, we, we're ready to think of principles that are, are true and have worked for a while, but we can, we can discard them. Yeah. And often in history, people have had to discard ideas that seemed very successful, yeah, sure. like Newtonian yeah. uh, void. Uh, now, uh, if you ask me, are there extra dimensions, that sounds like a statement about true or false. 
but to me that it's not, it doesn't have any definite meaning as a question about true and false. It has a question about effectiveness and fruitfulness. That, that I understand how to address. Mm -hmm. uh, and if something is not effective for hundreds of years, it might as well be false, even if it's true in some metaphysical sense. I don't, I, it's not. Well, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me make, okay, I'm, we'll leave this topic in a second, but I want to hit one more thing. All right. So this idea that there have been extra dimensions, you and I've had to deal with in, in particle physics yes. for, thir I mean, it's, it's been around for longer, but really becoming a key fad for popular. about 30 years. And, oh, and more than 40 now. Oh, yeah, no. No, 30, 1984, yeah, 30, 30 revolution, something like right, that. That's right, yeah. um, Would you say you think it's more likely or less likely now after 30 years based on, based on the fruitfulness oh. or lack thereof? Well, okay, the thing I feel comfortable in saying is that there was a brief time around 1984 mm -hmm. when it seemed to many people that uh, a grand synthesis was in the air where these ideas about extra dimensions would explain a lot of things we know about the world that we don't current that seem either uh, poorly understood poorly motivated or or just not understood today uh, and so at that time uh, I wasn't convinced but I, I, I mean I, I but I would have said that there were there were real possibilities that within five years the extra dimensions would have proved to be very fruitful and, and established as secure scientific fruitful principles. Uh, now, I, would, I don't think it's likely at all that, that it'll be proved in the next five years. So there's been, in that sense, negative progress. Yeah, okay, well, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to lead you to, to say that, but um, uh, so you heard it here. Um, although some people, one last thing, some yes. people have said that dimensions themselves are as illusory as particles, that the idea of a dimension is kind of artificial, and as you know, that oh. one person's four-dimensional universe could be another person's five-dimensional universe, and, and that idea has had some well, fruitfulness as an application. In well, it. yes, I mean, well, why stop there? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, computers can draw pictures of spaces of high enough, any number of dimensions that you want, but when you come down to it, computer code is, uh, is based on strings of zeros and ones. Yeah. So depending on whether your, your uh, sense of humor, you could say that's a one-dimensional space, just a <laughs> lot of zeros and ones, or a zero-dimensional space, because they're discrete. You, know, you can represent one thing in terms of another. There's no, the, the, that's very common in mathematics. That, and so there's no, unless you tell me what you mean by the statement that space is four dimensional, operationally in terms of things I can calculate and things I can check, uh, okay, if you wanna say the world is two dimensional and that, and you could, you, it's, I think you've got a lot of explaining to do, but okay. <laughs> but, but I don't think it's impossible. You can make, a, you know, you can make, topographic maps of Tempe yeah, and it's yeah. two-dimensional and still represents Tempe. <laughs> but uh, uh, whether it's, it's, again, it's a question of fruitfulness. Do you get, does, you, does this bizarre attitude buy you any success? And uh, we'll see, I don't know. Well, one of your favorite, I will say, <laughs> remind you of one of your fa my favorite quotes here is regarding one of these versions called string theory where you said string theory is very promising and it keeps promising and yes. promising. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, let's, let's go to the real world. And, uh, and I, there's one thing you mentioned, and, and I don't think people, it was, in the, it was hidden there, and it's something that I think is, is fascinating and, and related to the current model of particle physics. And, and, and since I have just written about it in my new book, <laughs> I saw my mind, which is, which is you, you took, mentioned the word superconductor. Yes. But, what is, uh, I want you to elaborate on the statement that people not real, realize it. So we're like fish in the water, but more than that, in a very real and exact way, yes. we are like people living in a superconductor. Right. And I, think, I thought it may be fun to discuss that a little bit. Okay, I censored myself because that's a little technical, but I can try, I can try well, well, to resuscitate. Well, we, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you long if we need to. But yeah, okay. okay. So uh, superconductors are materials that... Uh, 
uh, well, they're, they're common materials. Uh, aluminum is one, for instance, that if you cool, them down, cool it down to an extremely low temperature, behaves quite differently than uh, it, it has a, what's called a phase transition, like, broadly speaking, the difference between liquid and solid water, but this is a change in more subtle properties. It goes from being a, a, a mediocre conductor of electricity to a very good conductor of electricity if you cool it down enough. It's super conductor of electricity, perfect conductor. In principle, you can set up currents in a loop of this stuff and they'll last forever. They won't generate heat and dissipate. They don't need a battery, just keep going. Uh, now, uh, a deep characterization of superconductors, which sounds quite different but turns out to be closely related to this property, is that uh, if you try to put a magnetic field into a superconductor, it won't let you. It will set up currents that cancel the magnetic field that you try to impose. And that means that photons, the, or the things that make magnetic fields, can't penetrate very far into these materials. If you look at the equations that the photons in a superconductor behave, it turns out that instead of being massless particles that can uh, exert influences over long distances, inside a superconductor, uh, photons are massive particles. So they behave, they obey the equations of particles that have non-zero mass, which are less beautiful equations, but valid equations <laughs> that uh, uh, describe how photons behave inside superconductors. Now, in our models of particle physics, we have especially beautiful equations for particles of zero mass. Those have wonderful properties. Uh, However, some of the particles we'd like to describe as having zero mass, they don't. <laughs> so, but then we remember the superconductors say that, well, inside some kinds of materials, photons have mass. And we say maybe there's something like that going on in space. Maybe we're living in a different kind of superconductor that doesn't make photons have mass, but would make these other particles, the so-called W and Z bosons have mass. And that idea turns out to be extremely fruitful. It's been used as the basis of what's called the standard model of electroweak uh, interactions uh, uh, with great success since the 1970s. And experimentalists have tried very hard to knock it down. They would get Nobel Prizes if they disproved it. You know, and uh, they haven't. I mean, it's just looked better and better. So this picture. Uh, for many years was gathering evidence, uh, but there was one key element missing. Yeah. We didn't know what this material, this so-called, what, what, what the material was, what, yeah. what, 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 what uh, the superconductor was made out of. It's not an ordinary superconductor that's made out of electrons and, and nuclei, clearly. It's something else that, that fills space. And what was postulated and what made the equations work was something called a Higgs field, which is broadly similar to this quark-antiquark -quark condensate I mentioned to you. Uh, and that was used as a concept with great success for many years, but it was only in 2012, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah July 4, right, 2012. Right, 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 so like after almost 50 years of successful use and towers of theory and experiment based on it, that the substance was actually discover the so-called Higgs particle. So this was a tremendous triumph of and I, I just find physics. it fascinating. I, it's so fascinating that's what my new book is about. Sorry. <laughs> but, but, but no, no, but no, seriously, because it is not understood. We live in, a, there's this, as, it's as explicit as anything you said. Yes. There's an, a Higgs field everywhere if you want to think of a material. And if that material wasn't there, we wouldn't have mass. And we are literally like beings living in a superconductor would think photons yeah. were. So this world of ours is, is an illusion because of the material we happen to be embedded in. Well, it's a pretty convincing it's illusion. It's a pretty I wouldn't convincing call it illusion. illusion. I would call it illusion. But the, the, the illusion part is the thinking that empty space is empty. It's not empty. The, and and the thinking is, that the yeah. particles that have mass always do, and it's the natural way of being. Yes, but, that's right. But the, if, you went outside, if you went outside if, the ocean, if you were a fish, you'd learn 
Yeah, very learn, differently. You'd learn things that were, that were quite different. And, and it's and amazing. If you had enough imagination, you could have anticipated that while you were still in the water. Yeah, yeah. And that's sort of what we did. That's exactly <laughs> what we did. <laughs> right. Except, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we built the Large Hadron Collider to sort of poke out the water right. a little bit. That's right, yes. And it's, a tr it's really a testament to the best of what what it means being human, and, and in the last few weeks we've witnessed the worst. So, so um, anyway, the... the um, well, I hope the, we've witnessed the worst. Yeah, we'll yeah, I hope so. Uh, okay, two more things. I, I wanted to keep coming down to Earth here, and, 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 and that is part of Earth. But this notion, which is so fruitful of thinking of, 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 of the universe as a medium and, and materials and space as being... Some, has as you've pointed out, and we, as we just discussed, has come a long way. Yes. We're, we have by no means all the answers, and we have this beautiful standard model yes. that isn't quite complete, because the Higgs is there. We don't know why it's there. Well, it, yeah, I mean, we also don't know what the dark matter yeah, is. There are things that okay. are definitely not There's described. There's a lot of, so, what, so again, I'm going to ask you to think, where do you think the, the most fruitful area lies in the next few years of beyond the, what we would call beyond the standard model? Where, well, the, people the, have to discover axions. These particles which, which I introduced. You invented, that, but besides that, make the, that. They, <laughs> that make the dark matter and enable us to understand much better why the laws of physics look accurately the same forwards and backwards in time. I think we, I mean, this gets a little technical, but something called electric dipole moments that also relate to this difference between behavior forwards and backwards in time. Uh, any, and that, so that's as far as fundamentals are concerned. We'll we get to like, technology in a we'll second. We'll also have, yeah. Well, okay, okay, I'll get there. But I was thinking, first, I want to start with the fundamentals. So you think that, that essentially well, related to dark matter and, and the it, fundamental problems. And I'm still cautiously optimistic. It was easier to be optimistic a few years ago, but I'm ca still cautiously optimistic about uh, low energy supersymmetry, which oh, will it? enable us to... Uh, complete in many ways the logic of the standard model and unify the different the interactions that within it seem different uh, and unify bosons and fermions technically different kinds of particles that's that in the current formulation of physics they're kind of two separate kingdoms okay now, so this is interesting because you have uh, in some sense if, as a theorist you have your foot in both camps which is a good thing to be what um, well in the sense that we, so the supersymmetry is beautiful but it also generally predicts other kinds of dark matter candidates, which well, are, so. They could so be subdominant. Uh, yeah, okay, so which do you, th which you think is gonna be the dark matter? Axions. Super okay. Oh, definitely, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, think we'll discover supersymmetry of the Large Hadron Collider while it's still on? It's an open guess, but. but uh, I'm not at all look, certain, it's getting and I worse. sort of hesitate to speculate, but, but I hope so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think oh. the indirect evidence is, is really strong. The, the fact that there, there's, there are indirect calculations that I performed actually that, that, that uh, work only if you have uh, relatively light particles that are super, that are supersymmetric partners mm -hmm. of the particles we know about. And it's all a question of how relatively, how light are relatively light particles. So, uh, if they weigh one tera electron volt, they'll be accessible to the LHC. If they weigh 20, elect 20 tera electron volts, they won't be. And the theory is not really adequate to, dis to d distinguish those two cases. So we, it's it, it nerve wracking a, it, and frustrating yeah. and annoying, but uh, we just have to wait. We have to wait and see. But yeah, I think it's, it's not a, like it's a the beautiful Higgs idea. particle where we had sure. much more precise ideas. It is a beautiful idea, which is why I've also written about that. But, um, <laughs> um, but now, uh, the anions, I want to sort of end with the, with the technical aspect and what the, what the breakthroughs will be. And, and wh while you sort of alluded to it, anions may be very important as one potential candidate for quantum computing, which yes. a decade ago sounded very, uh, a nice idea, but one yes. th that I was quite skeptical one could ever right. really put in practice. What do you think the next 10 years of quantum computing and, 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 and anions or no anions? Well, I think there'll be, I mean, there'll definitely be progress. There, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, there are, you know, uh, money is being poured into it. There are a variety of interesting ideas. Uh, some of the things that appeared to be very difficult have been overcome, but it's like, you know, you have to, you have to get, uh, 
maybe, you, have, you know, you have to overcome 53 big problems, any of which if you don't do it, you don't have a useful quantum computer. And 10 years ago, all 53 were unsolved, and now maybe 10 are solved. <laughs> so it, it, there's a way to go. Uh, and it's hard to know. There's momentum, there's optimism, but it's very hard to predict. It's not, I don't think there's a fundamental problem. The, 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 the problems are problems of engineering and scaling things up, and uh, quantum computers are very delicate, and uh, the, the quantum part of quantum computers yeah, is very it's, delicate it's, and, and easily messed up. So. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm not sure 10 years is the right time scale. 20 years, it might be 30, So you think 50. Microsoft's making a long bet? Yes. Well, okay. long meaning I would be shocked if there was a useful quantum computer within five years or even 10 years. I'd be happy to be shocked, but okay. I wouldn't be shocked. Well, I'd be shocked if I were around to see it in 50 years. But <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be shocked if in 50 years there were useful quantum years. computers. But okay, so not only have we provided uh, the advice about the universe, we'd almost be shocked if there weren't in yeah. 50 years. Well, we've, yeah. pr we've provided some insights about that, but also useful insights about investing. <laughs> and and um, with that, I think we'll give you a break, and uh, we'll right. take your questions, and let me thank Frank. Okay, thank you. See you in a few minutes.